Well, welcome to the, uh, the final session. Um, if you'll be seated, we'll get started. Uh, the encounter of silence and uh, faith. Let me introduce first our two speakers uh, right at the outset, and then um, we can just uh, won't have to do, interrupt the uh, handing off of papers. Um, Michael Hanby, Professor Michael Hanby, of course, is known to all of you, Associate Professor of Religion and Philosophy of Science. He came to the Institute in 2007 from Baylor University, where he was Assistant Professor of Theology in the Honors College and Associate Director of the Baylor Institute for Faith and Learning. Before that, he was Arthur J. Ennis Fellow in the Humanities at Villanova University. Professor Hanby is the author of the uh, recent, just published this year, uh, monograph from Wiley Blackwell, No God, No Science, Theology, Cosmology, Biology. And uh, this book reassesses the relationship between the doctrine of creation, Darwinian evolutionary biology, and science more generally. He is also author of Augustine and Modernity, published by Routledge in 2003, which is simultaneously a rereading of Augustine's Trinitarian theology and a protest against the contemporary argument for continuity between Augustine and Descartes. He has contributed chapters to a number of volumes and is also author, author of several articles appearing in a number of journals, um, Communio, Modern Theology, Pro Ecclesia, and Theology Today, among others. So um, I will introduce also um, Professor Carlo Lancelotti a longtime friend, um, who is a professor of mathematics at the College of Staten Island and uh, on the faculty in physics at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, Dr. Lancelotti's field of interest is mathematical physics with special emphasis on non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Okay, I, I, I actually would, would like to describe here um, his, his research, pro his current research project, uh, which he, he says uh, leads to many very fascinating problems, which I'm sure it does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're all laymen, so... Um, uh, Dr. Lancelotti has published many research papers on various topics, wave propagation in plasmas and on the dynamics of clusters of stars, and I will go on. His research is currently supported by a three-year grant from the National Science Foundation and also a grant uh, from the City University uh, of New York and is being conducted in collaboration with other researchers, both at the College of Staten Island and other research uh, institutions. Uh, and I remember a paper that he gave actually several years ago at uh, Baylor University, a program actually uh, coordinated. Uh, that was a fun day. That was yeah. a fun day. <laughs> and uh, the final thing I'll mention, which uh, I think will be of interest to a lot of people. Um, uh, Professor Lancelotti uh, translated um, a selection of very interesting papers by uh, the uh, philosopher Augusto del Noce from Italy. And um, those papers uh, will be published in the coming year by McGill Queen's University in Canada. And the title of Del Noce, who is a very interesting contemporary philosopher, 20th century. He's not, he's still alive, is he? Uh, 
Okay. And uh, the book is called The uh, Crisis of Modernity. So I'm, uh, with that, having introduced our speakers, we'll begin with Professor Hanby. The last shall be first, but I keep waiting. Here I am bringing up the rear of another conference. Um, uh, <laughs> The, um, uh, with, with a paper that's finished more or less but the title, so I can't actually tell you what it's called because so far it's not called anything, so I'll just get right, right down to business. Um, to ask how the epistemological paradigm of science might be integrated with the wisdom proper to faith is to ask how faith, rightly understood, might contribute, or if I may be so bold, even uphold and secure the rationality of science. The question is obviously one of objective integration, of whether and how the truth of faith and the truth of science might truly coincide in one coherent and comprehensive picture of the world, adequate to its inexhaustible reality, and not merely the subjective question of how a person can be both a scientist and a believer, though obviously the two questions are deeply related. The question is too enormous to be dealt with adequately in a 30 minute, con 30 minute conference paper, and I am going to try and make this as close to 30 minutes as possible given the hour. So I can do a little more than sketch the contours of the problem and its resolution with broad impressionistic strokes. There are many distinctions to be drawn and questions to be asked on both sides in order to treat it in anything like comprehensive fashion. Just on the side of faith, there's the question of distinguishing and relating the fides qua creditur and the fides qua, and the question of how and whether the object of the fides qua, the self-revelation of God in Christ and the unity of time and eternity affected thereby, informs or transforms the structure of faith as act, habit, virtue, and gift. There's the question of how faith in these senses relates to that natural faith, pistis, which they perfect and elevate that trusting receptivity toward the self-communication of being, the yes to the world that has always already taken up residence in the, immediacy of, in the immediacy of our perception, which Aristotle placed near the foundation of cognition, nous. To treat any aspect of this question is eventually to implicate all the others. They force the question of what faith and reason and their objects actually are, and thus cannot but lead us into the very heart of the doctrine of God. From the side of science, we cannot resolve the question of faith without knowing what kind of reason science itself is. Is it simply a kind of ratio, in which case what is its relation to intellectus? Is it principally a theoretical or practical exercise? What can such distinctions even mean within science, most, science's most basic ontological assumptions? And how do these dimensions of scientific cognition and practice relate to natural philosophy and to metaphysics? The church teaches that there cannot be any conflict between faith and genuine science, because both, albeit via different routes, tend towards truth, porta fide 12, fides et ratio 34, etc. And yet, Lumen Fide also observes a sad irony prevalent in contemporary culture, that we seem to be suffering a profound crisis of truth, a crisis of both faith and reason, at the very moment that science flourishes as never before. What are we to make of this? If this is more than an accidental coincidence, and I think it is, then we have to ask why. Does science tend to render faith and philosophical reason incredible simply because a merely methodological and otherwise neutral science is corrupted by an extra scientific ideological scientism? Certainly, there is no denying that science can be corrupted by ideology. The history of science is littered with examples. But is it not also partly because modern science from the very outset tacitly conceives of being, reason, and truth, and thus the criteria of rational explanation in a way that precludes its principled integration with both the wisdom of faith and the wisdom of philosophy? Neither, I, n neither a priori deference to the unity of truth nor fear at the incredible power of science, which I fully concede, should prevent us from asking this question. For if the answer should turn out to be yes, as I believe it is, then even any attempt at a serious encounter 
between science and faith, much less a harmonious relationship between science, faith, and philosophy, will require us to renegotiate the meaning of truth and the nature of these criteria. Moreover, if ours is simultaneously a crisis of faith and a crisis of reason, then the recovery of a more comprehensive reason and the restoration of faith would seem to go hand in hand so that one could not finally be had without the other. And this in turn will require us to reopen the question of the nature and relation between faith and reason as such. Fortunately, the papers we've heard thus far have made a rich contribution toward that task and I'll simply be reiterating some of what my friends have already said. As most of the students here at the Institute will have heard me say many times, <clears throat> Modern science is premised both theoretically and historically upon the rejection of Aristotelian physics and metaphysics. Objectively, this means evacuating the, unit, the world of the unity, intelligibility, and interiority that follows from the ontological priority of form and the notion of being as act. And it means elevating matter to something positive and fully actual in its own right prior to and outside of form. Matter's basic quiddity as sheer externalized quantity and thus as the essentially measurable remains unchanged through its many modern variations, even through its many modern variations and through our ever more sophisticated capacities for measurement. Freeing matter from form made unmeaning ontologically prior to meaning and premised the actual world of things constituted an active relation to one another on a counterfactual world of quantities abstracted from what Husserl called the only real world, the world that presents itself to us in first order intelligibility. Hans Jonas is therefore right to claim that, quote, the analytical method implies a primary ontological reduction of nature that precedes mathematics or other symbolism in its application to nature, end quote. This reduction effectively denies that the all at once unity, intelligibility, and actuality that are experientially first are also ontologically first. Indeed, it means denying that unity, interiority, and intelligibility have any ontological toehold at all. Subjectively, then, modern science commences in an attempted renunciation of Aristotelian nous and pistis and begins instead with a basic distrust of the world as it communicates itself to our experience as an intelligible whole comprised of intelligible wholes at once simultaneous and successive. Descartes is the most obvious example of this mistrust, but his meditations simply dramatize a movement of abstraction from actuality intrinsic to the, or, to the ordo rationis of modern science. Nevertheless, I say science commences in an attempted renunciation of Aristotelian principles because if these principles truly depict something ontologically basic, an intelligible structure that is affirmed by the very act of thinking and a single actuality or communion in being that precedes any abstract separation of subject and object, then these principles will remain actual and operative within science even now, and even though they go unacknowledged, both on the side of scientific reason itself and on the side of its objects. And so the task of integration will in part be a task of analyzing scientific cognition, as Michael Polanyi has done, for instance, in order to bring science to a greater awareness of this fact and a greater philosophical self-knowledge. And the hope in this is that the act of scientific cognition is richer and the reality of scientific practice better than the implicit ontology of science allows. To say that the world has always already taken up residence in our being and experience is to say that synthesis is prior to analysis, that mind and world form an original unity and distinction in advance of their artificial separation as the condition of its possibility, a unity from which discursive thought proceeds and toward which it returns. Nevertheless, the new science seeks its truth by destroying this unity in thought so far as it is possible, by taking experience apart and analyzing it, as Francis Bacon put it, and then reconstructing this unity additively, so to speak, from the analyzed parts, 
which of course never add back up to the original whole. And it's the intrinsic unintelligibility of nature, consequent upon this demolition and the elimination of form and act, that warrants and mandates the priority accorded to analysis. Already, this hints at the way that a certain faith will function, both with respect to the new science, and it hints at a change in rational criteria. For it means that the intelligibility and unity of experience itself, which is the condition of possibility for science, need not fall within the purview of scientific theories and supplies no measure by which to judge the adequatio between science and the world. Appearances no longer need saving, in other words, except, of course, for those highly selective and contrived experience, ex appearances hypothesized by theory and affirmed by experimental analysis. Rather, they are to be set aside as far as possible, though the reductionist always exempts himself in the act of performing his reductions, in order to discover the truth that pre-scientific experience necessarily obscures. What is this truth? The inherent unintelligibility of the world presupposed by the new science institutes a radical heterogeneity between mind and world, which comes to expression first in the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, and later in the Kantian distinction between phenomena and noumena, which brings this this, cha this chasm to term. This makes a traditional pre-modern adequatio premised upon a community of form impossible. Consequently, the new criterion of scientific truth, indeed the only reliable measure of truth in this new world, is utility. Or as Francis Bacon puts it, what is most useful in operating is truest in knowing. And lest one think I'm stuck in the 17th century, William James would make the same claim in terms almost identical to Bacon's at the beginning of the 20th century in an attempt to give philosophical justification for radical empiricism. And he would attribute its triumph in part to the collapse of the residually platonic notion of truth embedded in early scientific conceptions of the laws of nature, though this was always a kind of Protestantized Platonism, uh, if you can talk that way, in which various things are extrinsically and, and indifferently governed by an eternal formalism. And there's a sort of planned obsolescence built into that um, that we could perhaps talk about, some kind of, kind of interesting. This conflation of truth and utility is easily m misunderstood, so we must make the point a little more precise. It's not simply that scientific knowledge is for the sake of utility or control as if every scientist were Goethe's Wagner trying to cook up homunculus in his basement. The objects of many sciences, astrophysics for example, lie largely beyond our control. The more basic sense of this phrase is rather that scientific cognition, what Jonas calls an analysis of distribution, is a knowing by means of and in the form of control through disassociating both in thought and in physical reality so far as possible what is given in being and experience as a synthesis. Subjectively, this is the meaning of the Baconian equation of knowledge and power, contemplation and action. The act of knowing is the action of dissociating or superinducing new forms on bodies so to establish regular, regular concurrences. For James, as for Locke, this is mirrored in the way that synthetic judgments are constructed out of analytic judgments. The subjective conflation of knowledge and power, contemplation and action, has its objective correlate in the conflation of truth and utility, which reduces the, be which reduces the being and the selfness of things to their being for us and amounts to the a priori instrumentalization of being qua being. For all intents and purposes, Scientific knowledge is precisely identical with the mastery we are able to exert over the phenomena of nature, though this mastery takes several forms, successful prediction or retrodiction, reliable replication of experimental results, successful synthesis of one experimental result with the next, or the successful manipulation of nature for our own ends. There are probably others. <clears throat> 
Scientific truth is synonymous with and measured by success in this regard. Hence, any challenge to the, to the noetic authority of science is met with the, with the perennial conversation stopper that science works. Though once truth becomes thoroughly pragmatized in this way, one simply needn't bother any longer with questions about the nature of truth or causality or the givenness of intelligibility itself. Once the truth of our knowledge is measured by its products, such questions become anachronistic relics of a platonic past now superseded. And philosophy and science go their separate ways, except insofar as philosophy exists to make the world safe for physics by putting an end to philosophy itself. In its overtly ideological and materialist guise, the a priori reduction, this a priori reduction of reason and truth relegates the unity, interiority, and intelligibility through which we necessarily live and move and experience the world to the epiphenomenal scrap heap of folk phenomena. In its humble and merely methodological guise, questions about the nature of these phenomena, like all true what is questions, are either ignored as irrelevant to a merely methodological pursuit or treated as a bewitchment of language, which lures us into idle verbal puzzles that are precisely in a technical philosophical sense, meaningless. In either event, the phenomena themselves are reduced to useful instruments for getting on in a world whose truth is measured by usefulness itself. Integration into higher orders of wisdom is refused in either case. It is difficult to overstate just how deep is the challenge which a functional or pragmatic conception of truth poses, not just to the integration of science and faith, but to the integration of science and philosophical reason. Final causes are also first causes, and so pragmatic truth makes the traditional object of contemplation, being qua being, simply disappear from the realm of the rational by changing or reducing the act of thinking itself to a horizontal compounding of extrinsically related facts. This indeed was William James's intent in advancing the idea as a philosophical justification for radical empiricism, to settle metaphysical disputes, not by resolving them, but by setting them aside as, as pointless, like milking a he-goat. That's the best thing in William James, that phrase, by the way. I, that's my great debt to him. I love it. Um, um, <laughs> uh, but like milking a he-goat, thus simply freezing out the unpragmatic philosopher, quote, as the ultramontane type of priests is frozen out of Protestant lands, end quote. It's worth stressing again that I am not accusing all scientists of being philosophical pragmatists. The metaphysical convictions of this or that scientist are not the issue. In fact, it's the great genius of pragmatic truth that it can be subjectively reconciled with any metaphysical judgments whatsoever, or none at all, because all are equally irrelevant to it, including those metaphysical judgments that made a pragmatic conception of truth thinkable in the first place. Clear, clarify this point too. They're not irrelevant in the sense that pragmatic method is indeed metaphysically neutral. Indeed, the very notion of mere method is pregnant with metaphysical judgment. Rather, metaphysics is irrelevant in the sense that pragmatic truth relieves one of the obligation of being ontologically serious or consistent. This is why conversation stoppers now function so often in the place of argument because every argument can, simply, can be stopped simply by asking some form of the question, what difference does it make? The problem then is not the subjective philosophical commitments of this or that scientist. These may be legion. It is rather that the apparent triumph of pragmatic, that after the apparent triumph of pragmatic truth, we don't seem to have the foggiest idea of how to go about affecting an objective integration of faith, reason, and science, even if we want to. If I were prone to hyperbolic and ap apocalyptic pronouncements, <laughs> I would say that pragmatism is a trick used by the devil to entice philosophy to kill itself and to rob us of our eyesight. <laughs> 
or even the desire to see. Fortunately, I'm not, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> True rapprochement between science and philosophy therefore depends, in George Grant's words, on the affirmation of a possible apprehension of the world beyond that as a field of objects considered as pragmata, not just as a matter of sentiment or some kind of two-world dualism where philosophy and science manage to coexist side by side in the separate spheres of life or in one mind but as one integrated comprehensive whole comprised of distinct but intrinsically related parts. Lumen Fide perhaps suggests something of faith's integral role in this. Commenting upon Moses' encounter with God on Sinai, the encyclical makes an allusion to the Pauline distinction between faith and sight and the definition of faith given by the letter to the Hebrews as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Faith by its very nature, the Pope writes, demands renouncing the immediate possession which sight would seem to offer. Renouncing the possession afforded by sight and embracing the more that is unseen, faith appears as the very antithesis of a mastering reason. For in order to be faith, it must regard the unseen not simply as that which is not yet mastered, but as essentially and permanently unmasterable. And so faith on this account implies a corresponding notion of reason that is receptive before it is active and contemplative before it is controlling. Faith thus appears to offer some hope that it can open up a space within reason wherein the mystery of being might speak in its own voice once again, thereby enlarging, enlarging rather than restricting reason's scope. Whether this is true, though, depends on what faith actually is and whether we grasp it adequately. Otherwise, we risk underwriting the current impasse rather than overcoming it. Earlier, I alluded to the role that a certain conception of faith and the invisible played in bringing this impasse about. Hegel, in his critique of Kant, calls it the very spirit of Protestantism, but it's worth asking, I suppose, whether there are some, version of ne some versions of neo-scholastic thought that don't have a similar effect. Kantian reason, Hegel writes, acknowledges its own nothing by placing that which is better than itself in a faith outside and above itself as a beyond to be believed in, end quote. Faith or belief here, which is essentially outside of reason as its antithesis, is premised on the antitheses of phenomena and noumena, finite and infinite. Because of this antithesis, quote, the sphere of the eternal, for all intents and purposes, is the incalculable, the inconceivable, the empty, the incognizable God beyond the boundary stakes of reason, whose a priori inconceivability plays a constitutive role in establishing those boundary stakes with clarity. For precisely in their dialectical opposition to finitude, God and the other pneuma negatively confirm the absoluteness of finitude, leaving this critically clarified reason with little to do but reflect upon itself and the patterns of regularity it finds among appearances. In Kant, of course, these patterns merely reflect the a priori structures of cognition, the law which subjective reason imposes on the manifold of possible experience. But inasmuch as the noumena phenomena distinction is simply the logical terminus of that older distinction between primary and secondary qualities, the point applies with equal force to the a prioriism of transcendental idealism and the a posterioriism, that's a mouthful, of experimental empiricism. After all, it was the empiricist Locke, writing before Kant, who said that thought could never advance one jot beyond its own ideas. And it was Kant who said that the, the irreconcilability of mechanical and teleological judgment requires us to pursue mechanical analysis of natural phenomena as far as we can, and refer the remainder to teleological judgment only as a reflective judgment. Here, then, is the crux of the difficulty. The Bible and tradition, not to mention the transcendent otherness of God, require us to affirm a distinction between faith and sight, promise and fulfillment. And yet, if we draw the distinction such that the renunciation of the possession offered by sight is simply a not seeing, superseded by the arrival of sight, or if we draw it conversely so that the light of faith 
is simply a light super added to reason from outside and voluntaristically chosen, then however close the new proximity of faith and reason, and however much the former guides, illuminates, and elevates the latter, faith and knowledge will remain essentially outside each other, and we will fail to achieve a true integration. And so we will invariably hand the world and its intelligibility over to a reason that is at once absolutized and reduced. Faith, then, inevitably becomes a matter of Jamesian sentiment or Protestant liberal feeling or Catholic pietism and is relegated to the role of providing moral guidance, aesthetic inspiration, or therapeutic support to a reason whose ontological judgments have made the good and the beautiful unintelligible. In any event, faith is excluded a priori from the truth of the world. Rather than understanding the act of faith as a simple not seeing or as a volunteer, voluntaristic response to a light superadded from without, we would do better, I suggest, to understand it as a kind of dispossessive seeing, inherent in vision itself, and so as the inner form of any knowledge that is adequate to its object. And I, here I take myself to simply be reiterating uh, a poor man's version of what Father Paolo and um, DC gave us this morning. So if there, are any, if there are any problems or holes or anything wrong, I really meant what they meant. Um, so, and, and they were right. Um, this dispossessive seeing presupposes that something is already given to see that its earnest is therefore an already a participation in the self-impartation of the scene. Yet it entails a trusting expectation, hope, that more will be disclosed. And so it preserves the distance between promise and fulfillment, earnest and consummation, that faith is always affirmed. But faith so understood is not simply a kind of incomplete or defective knowledge nor its shadow side simply a lack abolished or superseded by the consummation of sight. Though the consummation of the union of knower and known must surely transfigure our relation to the fides quae and to the passing events in the successio seculorum. Rather, on this view, faith's very character as faith is completed, fulfilled, and abides within the perfection of sight. And conversely, Faith in its perfection is an ingredient in the union of perfected vision, an ingredient which preserves the difference between knower and known in their very union. Like Augustine, we see in order to understand. But like the disciple Thomas, we also believe because we have seen. For this to be true, it must be possible for the same object to be simultaneously an object of faith and an object of sight. And the dispossessive character of faith, the trustful self-abandonment to the object of knowledge, and the patient expectation of a further revelation on its part, must be inherent in vision itself as the index of this abiding difference between knower and known in their very unity. In this way, the shadow side of faith is not simply a lack to be remedied, but is the reverse image of an inexhaustible superabundance on the side of the object, which continually gives itself to the subject. To develop these points with adequate precision and depth, one would need to think through this on the side of both subject and object. And I, I can't really do this here, and fortunately my friends have already taken us some distance down that road. Subjectively, one would have to develop Augustine's definition of belief, credere, as thinking with assent, to show how assent is intrinsic to thinking, and how the act of assent entails a trustful self-abandonment to the authority of another as a condition of genuine receptivity of the other in its otherness. In this case, part of the negative difference between faith and sight would be a failure of assent, an inability to will wholeheartedly, at bottom a failure of love. As Balthazar says, commenting on Romans 1, quote, the guilt of the pagans is that they do not place their natural faculties in the service of a believing submission to God but refuse the act of obedience that is an essential aspect of reason. And conversely, end quote, and conversely, the more, perfect the, unit, the more perfect the unity, the more wholehearted the ascent, the more complete is both the self-abandonment and the receptivity. Objectively, one would have to show how this coincidence of possession and dispossession 
obtains, tr obtains truly in the paradigmatic instance of knowledge as a consequence of a, of a differential excess internal to the perfect unity of knower and known. In other words, one would have to show how there can be something analogous to this dispossessive seeing and the obedient ascent of faith in that loving vision of the Father which constitutes the Son as Son, and how this affirms an infinite difference in the, as the form of their very unity, without this ever implying any lack in the superabundant plenitude of the divine essence or any compromise of divine simplicity. In brief, showing how faith is not simply a lesser light superseded by sight, but is ingredient in the perfection of sight, is a matter of showing how sight itself is transformed when its form and object are love. What is true of the prototypical instance of knowledge must be analogously true of the lesser instances. This means, first, that the object of the fides qua must analogously determine the subjective form of the fides qua, intrinsic to all knowledge, and second, that the finite objects of knowledge must have some analogical share in the inexhaustible depth proper to their archetype. So the phenomenological inside view of faith requires a metaphysical outside view, a creaturely metaphysics of creation as its presupposition and complement. Faith as dispossessive seeing is not an extrinsic superaddition to reason from beyond the clear a priori limits which reason sets for itself, but an intrinsic ingredient in any knowledge adequate to its object, precisely because knowledge must always be exceeded by its object in order for knowledge to be of the object and not merely a tracing around the finite contours of thought. Now we may begin to see how, with respect to science, faith might fulfill the role which Lumen's fide seemed to promise for it. Faith provides an antidote to controlling reason, not because it clearly determines reason's finite boundary stakes from a vantage point outside but because it opens reason from the inside to an intensive infinity of being that defies control, and so opens the doors of reason from the inside to a metaphysics which alone can supply a non-reductive account of these depths of non-instrumental intelligibility. Right, I'm almost there. Really almost. The shadow side of faith and a certain via negativa are thus applicable by analogy to both God and the world not because of reason's clear a priori limit or the unintelligibility of primary qualities or noumena, but because the unity and inexhaustibility of esse comune overwhelms sight with depth upon depth of meaning. The truth that the saint or the mystic or the poet or Father Paolo sees <laughs> as the light of the sun overwhelms the eye of the owl. This in turn implies a more, and then this is the, Concluding point, this in turn implies a more comprehensive criterion by which to judge the adequatio of science to the world. A criterion which thus includes those ineliminable aspects of being and experience which pragmatic truth regards as unreal or irrelevant. This criterion is, quite simply, the whole of reality. A more rational account is a more comprehensive account, one that includes the pre scientific Lebenswelt the immanence, transcendence, and unity and interiority from which science itself proceeds and which marks its living objects as the dramatic centers of being and action, the ends in themselves that they actually are. A more comprehensive account is one that includes both the intelligibility, which is its own condition of possibility, and the inexhaustibility of its objects, the positive reason why the restless activity of science is interminable. There are negative reasons as well. Balthazar has it right. He who sees the most wins. By this criterion, the genetic reductionist who gazes upon his daughter and pretends to see nothing but a survival machine, a puddle of genes, or an autocatalytic dissipative system, who can give no rational account of what he cannot help seeing, is rather like a bad poet. Faith thus guiding and illuminating reason from the inside can secure and protect the rationality of science because it rescues the whole of being and experience from a science which, left to its own devices, would make both scientific reason and the world less than they actually are. Faith thus holds, upholds the rational, rationality of the scientific enterprise by saving the appearances for the sciences, 
and it saves the appearances for the sciences by saving the being in itselfness of what doesn't yet appear as the ground of appearance itself. With faith comes hope, and with this faith we might dare to hope for what Kant did not, a, reconcili a reconciliation of teleological and mechanical judgment. For nothing that is true or even truly useful in mechanical analysis is lost by supposing that being is gratuitous and that logos is prior to unmeaning, that wholes ontologically precede their parts even as they await their unfolding in time, and the synthesis consequent upon being self-communication it's having always already taken up residence in me is prior to analytic abstraction as its condition of possibility. Nothing is lost, that is, save the dangerous reductionist fantasies that have been inherent in such analyses from the beginning and persist even now in the anti-reductionist attempts to overcome them. It simply requires us to recognize that things can manifest themselves mechanically because there are first things irreducible to mechanism and that mechanical analysis itself is never merely mechanical. And really, this only requires us to say yet, to say yes to what we can't help but know, to say yes to what thinking affirms in its every act. Perhaps then, this really isn't so hard after all, in spite of all I've said about the intractability of pragmatic truth. Perhaps Peggy is right simply and profoundly right. Faith is obvious. Faith can walk on its own. To believe, you just have to let yourself go. You just need to look around. Thank you. Hello. So, thank you for the invitation. It is a particular honor to be the rear of the conference and to be brought up by Michael Hamby. Uh, of course, I'm speaking way out of my disciplinary field, so be patient with me. Our task today is to discuss the encounter of faith and science, and of course, a necessary requirement for such discussion is some clarity about the meaning of these terms. For instance, as you well know, the Christian act of faith is very different from generic religious belief. And likewise, a rigorous empirical investigation of nature has very little to do with science, in quotes, in the sense in which the word is used and abused, both in popular culture and in academic discourse. More generally, our topic carries a lot of cultural and historical baggage, which I think is the real issue here. Therefore, I will start by making some preliminary remarks about what I think is the correct way to frame the question, and a little later on, I will try and address the specific question of the encounter of faith and science as it takes place in the experience of a thesis, which is what I do, and its philosophical and theological significance. Okay, first of all, the first remark, I think it is important to emphasize the difference between our topic and what many people regard as a close equivalent, named the so-called dialogue between science and religion, which is what you can find in the popular press, I personally find the latter formula ambiguous and misleading. The problem is not simply that the two terms, science and religion, are so hopelessly general and vague that an intelligent discussion is almost impossible. The deeper reason for such ambiguity is that in contemporary culture, science and religion often constitute two sides of one single mythological construction or narrative. Some time ago, I was translating an essay by Augusto del Noce about the advent of the so-called technological or affluent society after World War II, and the remark caught my eye. Del Noce says that when Western culture rejected metaphysics, what was left was science and religion. Not science, mind you, but science and religion. Because in mainstream culture, these two are basically inseparable. They need each other because they define each other. Science is the domain where religion is no longer, and religion is the space that has not yet been filled by science, even if it will be filled in some sort of secularized eschaton, which may come about far in the future or lie just around the corner like the singularity. This dialectic pair, science and religion, is a subject of a dualistic, Gnostic, foundational myth which dates back to the European Enlightenment as a completely impervious to rational discourse. As a result, it is very hard to use these words without implicitly accepting many dubious philosophical presuppositions. 
So this is my first premise. Another preliminary remark is that the encounter of faith and science should not be just discussed in general, subspecie eternitatis. First of all, it should be observed as it concretely takes place in history, not just in the lives of individual Christian scientists, but in the lives of culture and societies. In particular, we should ask ourselves to what extent the very birth of modern Western science in late medieval and early modern Europe was the result of such encounter. While we should not understate the scientific achievements of classical Greece, it is a fact that modern science in a specific sense, as a combination of rigorous empirical observation and mathematical modeling, was born out of the intellectual fermentation of Western Christendom between the 13th and the 16th centuries. Why was that the case? Most <coughs> explanations in terms of historical or sociological factors fall short. If science were the product, the natural product of a well-organized administrative bureaucratic society keen on technological app applications, a pragmatic society, it should have been born in China. In-depth exposure to the Hellenistic scientific tradition was more available in the is Islamic world than in Europe. A very sophisticated mathematical tradition could be found in India. If anything, the birth of European science has been often and correctly traced back to the milieu of medieval universities. The first natural philosophers, Horace, Buridan, Roger Bacon, <coughs> uh, the early Jesuit, Christopher Clavius, Galileo himself were university men. Medieval Europe was indeed the first civilization that produced a transnational independent community of scholars dedicated to teaching and scientific research. But why did that happen? Ultimately, one is first to look for explanations that go beyond sociology. In my opinion, the question of the birth and development of European science would be more fruitfully studied from the standpoint of what, would be call, what could be called theological anthropology. By this, I mean the study of the transformation of human personalities and cultures brought about by the action of grace. In particular, theologians should reflect about the ways in which the grace of faith affects and transforms human reason, opening it up to all, aspect of reality, all aspects of reality. Here I would like to quote a passage from the recent encyclical Lumen Fidei. Faith also illumines the material world, trusts its inherent order, and knows that it calls us to an ever-widening path of harmony and understanding. The gaze of science thus benefits from faith. Faith encourages the scientist to remain constantly open to reality in all its inexhaustible richness. Faith awakens the critical sense by preventing research from being satisfied with its own formulas and helps it to realize that nature is always greater. By stimulating wonder before the profound mystery of creation, faith broadens the horizon of reason to shed greater light on the world which disclose itself to scientific investigation." End of quote. I am convinced that a careful historical study would show that these words of Lumen Fide, Fide apply well to medieval and early modern science. Medieval Christendom produced, in quotes, a critical mass of people who were certain that the order of nature reflects the beauty of an uncreated logos and that by its very constitution, human reason can participate in such eternal logos also through the contemplation of the hidden mathematical harmonies of creation. Therefore, precisely because of its faith, European Christianity was able to support the systematic effort to seek the truth for the sake of the truth which, generally speaking, preceded the quest for technological advancements and was its necessary precondition. Obviously, this is not the occasion even to outline this kind of study. However, I would like to make a brief digression to point out that it is impossible to interpret correctly the specific contribution of Christian faith to the development of Western science unless we free ourselves from the standard modernist and secularist interpretation of the relationship between the, exp the expansion of science and modernity. At least since the Enlightenment, the undeniable fact that modern science was born out of a civilization founded on Christianity has been an obvious source of embarrassment for secular thinkers. Their answer has been to interpret the birth of European science not as a fruit of faith, but rather as the beginning of a break with faith, as the temporis partus masculus of modernity. In secular culture, this view has risen, has since risen, to the rank of an unquestionable truth and one of the pillars of the modernist interpretation of history. We should know better. It is certainly true that scientific progress had a major impact on Western culture and had many philosophical and even theological reperceptions, as Michael described. Uh, sorry. But the prevalent cultural and philosophical interpretation of science are not science. In this respect, we have to be watchful against the temptation of intellectualism, which is to confuse the intellectual reconstruction of, what, of reality 
of human realities with subhuman realities. For instance, we all know the role of Francis Bacon in shaping the modern understanding of science. Yet, he had no such role in the development of early modern physics as physics. We all know the enormous impact of Cartesian rationalism on the European awareness of the relationship between man and nature. Yet, if we study the history of science properly, properly understood in the 17th century, we reach the same conclusion as Robert Lenoble in the conclusion of his monumental study of the life and works of Valentin Marcin. Namely, Lenoble says, Cartesianism was truly a metaphysical accident in the history of science as science. Similar considerations apply to the complicated two-way relationship between science and culture during the Enlightenment as, or even in the age of positivism. Science does have its own trajectory, which for sure reflects a number of metaphysical assumptions. Uh, assumptions. But such metaphysical assumptions are not necessarily those of Bacon, Descartes, De Rock, Kant, Condorcet, Saint-Simon, Comte, Spencer, and other cultural interpreters of science who, with their exceptions, played no role whatsoever in its actual development. Unfortunately, even non-modernist Catholic thinkers have often accepted uncritically the claim that the development of science and the expansion of modernity in a cultural and physical sense are two aspects of the same phenomenon. My personal conviction, which I do not have time to justify adequately, is that to think so means accepting a tendentious reconstruction of history, merely changing the assessment from positive to negative. In fact, there is a fearful symmetry between the attribution of an implicit bad metaphysics to the scientific method per se and the secularist claim that science shares the same philosophical premises of modernity. This is just an example of a general problem which was also described by Del Noce, who pointed out that the anti-modern position fails to criticize the idea of modernity, but just turns around its axiological meaning by interpreting the development of modernity as a process not toward fullness, but towards nihilism. Such failure to criticize the idea is a sure recipe for defeat, because by accepting the myth of the unbreakable unity of scientific progress and modernity, one accepts the very core of the secular modernist position and is then forced to follow it to many of its consequences. Conversely, I think that the rigorous critique of the modernist interpretation of the history of science is of decisive importance in order to start exorcising the Gnostic myth of science and religion that I mentioned earlier. Having said all of that, I'm now ready to try and tackle more directly the question that has been posed to us. The, quote from Father Antonio, organic relation and possible integration of faith and science. Since I just argued that science should be considered not as an abstract cultural construct, uh, as the main actor in the foundational myth of modernity, but rather as it concretely emerges in the work of the scientists, I would refer mostly to the science I personally know and practice, which is physics. This is not a complete sacrifice of generality because physics was the firstborn among modern scientific disciplines and is widely regarded as a paradigm of the so-called scientific me method. As is well known, such method is a two-track process. On one hand, there is a systematic effort to carry out quantitative observations of natural phenomena. Here, the word quantitative refers to the fact that the physicist needs to identify measurable aspects of a given phenomenon and to develop suitable instruments of measure in order to collect an adequate set of data about the phenomenon in question. The second track is, of course, the theoretical side. It is the development of mathematical models which describe the outcome of our measurements and can be used to predict, to some degree of approximation, the outcomes of large classes of comparable experiments and observations. Clearly, the combination of quantitative measurement and mathematical modeling makes for a fairly abstract form of knowledge. First of all, a physicist must pull out of the universe one small subsystem that can be the object either of direct observation, like in astrophysics, or of a laboratory experiment. Secondly, out of the many aspects of our experience with a physical object, the physicist abstracts or extracts a priori what can be the object of quantitative empirical measurement. Only then, the measured data can be compared with various possible mathematical constructs in order to select a viable theoretical description of nature. This is, in my opinion, a perfectly legitimate procedure as long as the scientist is aware that he is only studying nature qua physical and qua measurable in the context of a specific methodological abstraction. Of course, it is not obvious a priori that the artificial reality created by these multiple abstractions and each, 
its equally abstract mathematical description should be related at all with the real world as it presents itself to us in its ontological richness. And yet, a miracle of sorts takes place. I will describe it in the words of Simone Weil. The coincidence of the stars with the need of the human imagination is an irreducible mystery. Games and tools, she means laboratory experiments and mathematical models, games and tools appear at first sight less mysterious because they are made by men, but the fact that they should be able to make such things and use them is a grace as extraordinary as the existence of the stars. It is one and the same grace, and strange to say, the object studied by science is nothing other than this grace. In order to think mathematically, we must, sorry, in order to think mathematically, we put aside the world. At the end of this effort of renunciation, the world is given to us as a bonus. It is given, indeed, at the price of an infinite error, but nevertheless really given. The fact, end of quote, the fact that natural phenomena obey, sometimes to an amazing degree of precision, elegant mathematical laws conceived by the human mind is an enduring source of puzzlement, puzzlement and wonder. As noted physicist Eugene Wigner once said, quote, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift, which we neither understand nor deserve, end of quote. The mystery is twofold. That nature should obey simple, harmonious mathematical laws is mysterious. And that the human mind be able to imagine the universe mathematically is also mysterious. What takes place is really the encounter of two minds. In its effort to imagine the universe, the human mind encounters another mind, discovers that in some mysterious sense, natural reality is itself thought. So much so that the scientist's greatest achievement is to be able to rethink approximately, and confusedly, what has already been thought. As Einstein once remarked, in the laws of nature, an intelligence so superior is revealed that in comparison, all the significance of human thinking and human arrangements is a completely worthless reflection. These simple remarks show clearly on what ground faith and science encounter each other most naturally. By discovering the harmonious mathematical structure inscribed in the order of the cosmos, a scientist is forced to affirm the primacy of thought and meaning against formless matter. By itself, this step does not amount to faith in the full Christian sense. In fact, this insight had already been basically achieved by classical Greek philosophy. Nevertheless, it is also true that the affirmation of the rationality and intelligibility of reality, not only in the mathematical sense, obviously, is an integral part of the Christian act of faith. As you know, the relation between faith and reason, and in particular between Christian revelation and classical Greek philosophy, has been one of Joseph Ratzinger's favorite themes. He has repeatedly emphasized in his writings how modern science has given, quote, amazing solidity to the old Pythagorean and, Gal and in, in Galilean intuition, Galilean is Galileo, not Galilee, um, about the God who practices geometry, end of quote. And he has also highlighted, Ratzinger, the link between this intuition and faith, stating that, quote, Christian faith in God means first a decision in favor of the primacy of the logos as against mere matter. In other words, faith means deciding for the view that thought and meaning do not just, uh, do not just form a chance byproduct of being, that on the contrary, all being is a product of thought, and indeed, in its innermost structure is itself thought." End of quote. From this perspective, an initial integration of faith and science also follows. Within the context of its own particular methodological abstraction, science sustains the scientist's act of faith, nourishing, quote from Ratzinger, his conviction that the objective mind we find present in all things is the impression and expression of subjective mind, and that the individual structure that being possessed, and that we can rethink, is the, not just rethink, is the expression of a creative premeditation to which they owe their existence, end of quote. On the other hand, faith confirms the scientist's methodological assumption about the fundamental rationality of the universe, and by doing so, gives much needed existential depth to the whole scientific enterprise. But here a question may arise. Certainly, the decision, and quote from Ratzinger, the decision in, the, in favor of the primacy of the logos is far from exhausting the Christian act of faith. As Ratzinger goes on to say, Quote, the mathematician discovers the mathematics of the cosmos, the being thoughtness of things, but no more. He discovers only the God of the philosophers, end of quote. 
Conversely, it goes on. If Christian belief in God is first of all an option in favor of the primacy of the logos, it is at the same time the belief that the original thought is not anonymous, neutral consciousness, but rather, which is what Einstein more or less believed, but rather freedom, creative love, a person. It is the option for the primacy of freedom against the primacy of some cosmic necessity or natural law. End of quote. Therefore, if the, at the ultimate core of reality we find love and freedom and a relationship of person, persons, should that not be reflected in some way in our study of nature and help us go beyond the narrow deterministic and analytic perspective that underpins the scientific method? A closely related question, which was raised some time ago by David, is whether the method methodological abstraction of science, as, com as commonly understood, does not in itself give cover to incorrect met metaphysical assumptions, inasmuch as it posits a purely external or exterior relationship between creation and creator. Once again, I think that we must carefully distinguish between the inner logic of the scientific enterprise and its cultural and philosophical interpretations. It is certainly possible to interpret the methodological abstraction proper to physics in the context of a mechanistic ontology. Just as certainly such interpretation has been and still is quite strong in our culture. But this does not mean, in my opinion, that the mechanistic ontology is somehow coessential to such abstraction or even to the resulting physical theory. Now, this is a complicated question that could be discussed from many angles and we don't have time. I'm under, I'm under the impression that one thing that needs to be clarified here is the distinction between philosophical mechanisms, in the sense again of an incorrect understanding of the relationship between creator and creation, and determinism as an ubiquitous feature of physical theories and not only most scientific theories in general. It may appear, perhaps, that a deterministic description of nature somehow implies and supports a mechanistic ontology. Inasmuch as the universe, the universe appears to be well described by impersonal mathematical laws that seem to unfold in a purely extrinsic fashion, in complete indifference, apparently, to what lies beyond them and transcends the methodological abstraction of mathematical physics. I believe that this is a misunderstanding. Therefore, in the last part of my talk, I would like to offer some remarks about what I think is the philosophical and theological significance of physical deter of scientific determinism, and then this will also lead me to some final comments about the integration of faith and science. First of all, I want to witness to the fact that the prevalent experience of a good physicist, at least mine, is one of obedience, as opposed to control. Nature itself forces on him, or me, the form of abstraction that is proper to his discipline. And progress in his investigations can only be achieved by obeying reality as it manifests itself through experiments, observations, and numerical simulations. Within the methodological abstraction proper to physics, nature does present to itself as deterministic, as ruled, in fact, by some kind of the cosmic necessity mentioned by Ratzinger. Definitely, in physics, determinism is not a reflection, in my opinion, of an a priori metaphysical prejudice or of an incorrect abstraction but the largely unavoidable outcome of our best effort to look at the natural world qua physical. To me, this suggests that indeed we should not be chasing the ghost of a different science in a strict technical sense. Of course, we should chase the ghost of different scientists because, you know, there is always, <laughs> that's a big problem, but rather we should, look, we should look a bit more carefully at the theological side of the question, which is not my business, but at this point I have nothing to lose. <laughs> so, and, uh, no. and, yeah. For it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> at, at the risk of stepping onto arduous terrain, I would like to suggest that the question of determinism in science is tightly linked to a broader question, which I would tentatively call the relation between freedom and necessity within God's creative act. Here I would like to refer again to some passages by Simone Weil, which I've been reading a lot recently for other reasons, who wrote about this question in several of her works. In her writings, Necessity seems to play a twofold role in creation by simultaneously unveiling and veiling. On one hand, necessity unveils God, precisely by revealing the primacy of the logos that we have just discussed. As she puts it, quote, forces in this world are supremely determined by necessity. Necessity is made up of relations which are thought. Consequently, consequently 
the force which is supreme in the world is under the supreme domination of thought. The sensible universe in which we find ourselves has no other reality than that of necessity, is made up of mind materially present in our flesh. You know that in our life, in our life Simone Weil moved progressively towards Platonism, okay? So I'm not endorsing everything she says, but I think this is interesting. She says, science in its different branches apprehends through all phenomena mathematical relations. Eternal mathematics, that is the stuff of which the order of the world is woven. Therefore, scientific investigation is simply a form of religious contemplation, end of quote. On the other hand, she also says, necessity is God's veil. This veil is necessarily, end of quote, this veil is necessary, paradoxically, precisely because the creator creates out of freedom and love. In fact, freedom requires separation and love requires distance. Therefore, God, who is and remains everything, freely makes space for something. Quote from Veil again, limitation is the evidence that God loves us. End of quote, because, new quote, God can only be present in creation under the form of absence. End of quote. But this very space, given us by the free creative act of God, is also the space where necessity runs its course. She continues, quote, the absence of God is the most marvelous testimony of perfect love, and that is why pure necessity, necessity which is manifestly different from the good, is so beautiful, end of quote. At the same time, of course, God remains all in all, and necessity itself manifests him, because the universe obeys a divinely established order. One more quote from Vail. The mechanism of necessity, seen from our present standpoint, is quite blind. If, however, we transport our hearts to where our Father dwells, and if we regard this mechanism, regard this mechanism from there, it appears quite different. What seems to be necessity becomes obedience. Matter is entirely passive and, in consequence, entirely obedient to God's will. End of quote. Crucially, according to Weil, Simon Weil, such obedience is also the source of the world's beauty. And this is the final step I want to take, the connection between necessity and beauty. For anyone who has reached this point, uh, the last quote, second to the last quote from, uh, from Simone Weil, for anyone who has reached this point, absolutely everything here below is perfectly beautiful. In everything which exists, in everything which happens, he discerns the mechanism of necessity, and he recognizes in this necessity the infinite sweetness of obedience. For us, this obedience of things in relation to God is what transparency of a window pane is in relationship to light. Therefore, she adds, quote, in the beauty of the world, harsh necessity becomes an object of love. The eyes, no, end of quote. The way I understand this quote, of course, there are, some of them are a little extreme. She was a very strong personality, but I think that what, I, what I get out of it is that the eyes of faith discern the true source of the beauty of nature. Nature is beautiful because, by its necessity, it makes itself completely transparent to the beauty of the creator Logos himself. In particular, the harmonious mathematical laws that scientists discern in the universe are just one aspect of this transparency through necessity, my formula, of creation. In this way, and now I come to my conclusion, faith sheds a new light on one of the most fundamental experiences of every scientist namely the profoundly aesthetic dimension of the mathematical study of nature. Many great scientists, I could quote uh, Poincaré, Chandra Sekhar, Einstein, really the majority of really good scientists have affirmed that what motivated them in their pursuits was aesthetic attraction more than practical considerations. In practice, however, like every human effort, science is always a danger of corruption, of losing its original ideal impulse and being reduced to something less. Typically, becomes a mere quest for technical power or a form of self-affirmation on the part of the scientist. In the long run, these reduced motivations cannot support scientific progress because when science stops looking for the truth above all else, it slowly starts to die. And beauty is what attracts us to the truth. As Simon Weil also said, final quote, I promise, quote, the spirit of truth can dwell in science on condition that the motive prompting the savant is the love of the object which forms the stuff of his scientific imagination. Uh, where is it? Oh, sorry, the stuff of his investigation. That object is the universe in which we live. 
What can we find to love about it, if it is in its beauty? The true definition of science is this, the study of the beauty of the world. It is precisely at this aesthetic level that the full integration of science faith takes place. Faith's crucial contribution is not to produce an alternative science, but to give the scientist the possibility of living his vocation without reduction as a quest for truth. It does so by revealing to him that the beauty of the world is not an illusion, but the very same beauty that has become flesh and dwells among us. Thank you. Thank you both very much uh, for your very stimulating uh, presentations. Uh, first, let me just ask if uh, the two of you want uh, to say anything to each other before uh, we, we been, open. We've been fighting for, after for you. a year. Yeah, after you. <laughs> yeah, should, should we do all of that? Yeah, that well, let's talk about how our close. Yeah, yeah, well, well to two, two things real quick. Yeah, one is, um, I mean, you're, what you're constructing is an independent thing. I assume it wasn't a, re a response to what you think I'm saying, uh, ex except for the obedience thing, um, which I want to ask you actually how you know you've been obedient. What's the test of, 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 of your obedience? Okay. Um, presumably, it works itself out in the description you gave of physics, which I took to be precisely what I was describing. So okay. um, uh, so there's a kind of, uh, I'm not sure the, the obedience to the exclusion. I'm not sure obedience and command exclude each other. Okay. Um, they no, didn't big, 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 big on yeah. the contrary. Yeah, yeah. They can command through this, but that's not what you meant. Yeah, well, I know it's not what you meant, but I'm not sure that it's not the case. It's true. Um, you can do that. Um, uh, but that's, that's one thing. Second thing is, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think you're actually absolutely right, in fact, that um, the, what you call the modernist interpretation of the sort of dialectical relationship between science and faith. Um, or science is and modernity. science and modernity, or science and religion, or however you wanted to characterize it, um, the inverse proportionality is is false. Um, the problem, as I see it, would not be uh, that there is. I mean, there's a, there there comes to be a sense in which um, what I'm calling a, a, a pragmatic uh, notion of truth makes uh, the relation to metaphysics and theology, in some sense irrelevant and in another sense not. But as far as, far as the historical development is concerned, the, the whole point would be, or my whole point would be, that you're precisely right, that there is a theology, a sort of theologia naturalis embedded uh, in the historical development of science, and it continues to be perpetuated, and that's in fact part of the problem. Um, but Is that the opposite of what they said? No, no, no. Well, only insofar as I didn't want to be included within your um, bad modernist interpretation. That's all. Um, all right. I'll, We'll do our dirty laundry or our dueling later. Uh, Dr. Walker. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Carlo, that was that was really uh, a brilliant paper. Right. Um, uh, but just a, a, and you said something that uh, a couple of things that helped me to focus the question, or what, what I think is a, a question that still remains. Uh, at, one, at, at a certain point you talked about physics as um, uh, focused on nature qua physical. And uh, the question for me is, what is nature qua physical? What's the qua? I mean, now you, you went on, if I understood you correctly, to give the following answer that uh, it has to do with matter obeying mathematical laws by something, by virtue of something that from one point of view looks like mechanical necessity, but from a deeper, from another point of view is obedience and that the unity of necessity and obedience is a kind of beauty. And I have to say, I, f I find that, um, I find that very, I find that compelling. I mean, I think that that's a that that there's something wonderful about that about that account of things. The only problem is that it still leaves open the question 
what about substance and form? What about, or what about this, this problem of secondary and primary qualities that, that Michael brought up? Uh, because those are, at least on the face of things, those are, I mean, to talk about the qua physical in terms of substance and form and so forth, or to talk about nature qua physical in terms of substance and form is a different way of talking about the qua from the one that, that you developed with Weil. And so the point is, uh, which, which of these accounts is true, or are they, are they both true? And then if they're both true, then um, do we just sort of say they're both true and we leave it at that, or, or what do we say? Um, the two accounts are the one I gave? And the one you gave, and, the, and, a, and one in terms of something like substance and form, an Aristotelian I mean, one. Though, hold on, let me, just, let me just finish. A kind of an Aristotelian one. Um, and I'm not, I'm not claiming that the two accounts have to be mutually exclusive, but I'm just saying they're different, and the question of thinking through the relation and to use the cliche of the integration of them so that we don't, we're not just sort of affirming that, you know, there's a mechanical explanation and a teleological explanation and somehow both are true. Th that's the task. And it seems to me that we have to hold on to something like substance and form because otherwise we lose things. And I took that to be the burden of, well, one of the burdens of Michael's thing that, in other words, to talk about intelligibility as, you know, obedience to mathematical law and so forth is surely true, but it doesn't, it doesn't yet, uh, it doesn't yet sort of guarantee things you know, the things that we experience and what he called first order intelligibility. So anyway, that's, that's where I see, to, that I think this is a real, it's, it's a question. I mean, I don't, I don't have the answer either. I mean, I have some ideas, but I won't, I, I won't bore you with them. But I think that's really, it's really a crucial question. I don't think there is a contradiction, although I would be hard pressed to give a good explanation right here. But the first thing that comes to mind is that anyway, geometry, belongs to the realm of form in some sense, it does. well, doesn't it? I mean. It does, it does. I mean, and I actually think that's a really interesting thing is that, um, the, I mean, the people who came up with the idea of the sort of Pythagorean idea thought in terms of geometry largely, not only, but largely. And, and that's interesting because geometrical forms are forms. And they have, and, and at least Euclidean geometry has some kind of seems to have some sort of relation to um, perceptions of, of, of things. And, and that's very interesting. Um, and again, I mean, I could say a lot more, but I won't, I mean. Yes, here. So I have a question for Dr. Hemby. Uh, earlier we, we, le we heard uh, especially from Professor Schindler's uh, talk, that the technological metaphysics actually is against knowing as such. Because he was saying, for example, that it's very diff difficult to know something just through the internet, right? If that is the case, okay, so the, the, the technological uh, and metaphysics that is intrinsically technological is against knowing as such. <coughs> if science is, as, as you, Dr. Hemby, said, is identical with the mastery of reality. How can, it, how can he know anything at all, as it appears to be the case? Historically speaking, how would it, was it possible for science to know something about the structure of reality if its premises were technological? Well, because there's a difference between its premises and what it actually is. Um, and that, that goes to the point that um, I hinted at but didn't really, couldn't really unfold and develop, <laughs> which is that um, uh, mechanical analysis depends on immechanical principles, right? I mean, if you, if you were serious, if you were a thoroughgoing mechanist, all you would have is extensivities temporally and contiguously related to one another. You wouldn't have anything. So that in order to have anything at all, you have to take recourse uh, to form. Um, and so the, the, the point would be that, that form is um, uh, implicated already. Um, and so that a purely mechanical analysis is problematic, that, or, or, or is impossible. 
um, which is why I said that scientific practice um, uh, and scientific cognition themselves, uh, the reality is actually better than uh, the ontology of the theory. Uh, so I'm not denying that scientific, that, that, that mechanical analysis doesn't give us a kind of knowledge of operations, both because on the subjective side and on the objective sides, it trades on things that its own um, uh, conceptual tool, toolbox don't, can, doesn't contain. Um, and, and so what, and because it doesn't contain it, we wind up precisely here when this sort of question comes up, right? How do you, how do you get back to things? Um, and can you get back to things simply through matter obeying laws and geometry? I mean, will that give you a he-goat? Um, it seems to me that there are other, uh, other um, uh, principles that are required, metaphysical principles, um, that science tacitly, if I can say science in a, in, in a, in a general sense, I'm now chastened about that, um, but uh, that, that, that science tacitly draws upon, that are operative because they're true, um, but that it can't cognize. Uh, and therefore, in a certain sense, lacks um, the capacity to be adequate to, um, th in the very response, the very non-responsive, non-reductive response, non response um, uh, that is sort of erotically elicited from phenomena in the way that, that, that um, Carlo described. So I'm not denying that scientific knowledge is knowledge. What I'm saying is, is that, that uh, scientific knowledge, A, trades on more than it can admit or account for, uh, and B, has a very difficult capacity relating uh, the kind of knowledge that it does give us to uh, the subjects uh, that, 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 that knowledge is knowledge of. And it has a tendency, therefore, to remake those subjects themselves as, yeah, the sum of, of, of its own abstractions. So I don't know if that um, answered. Yeah. Camacho, and then Father Peter. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, my question to Dr. Hamby, although um, perhaps you can also speak to it. Um, would you, I mean, it, it seems to me it is striking that modern technological science came out of the Christian West. Sure. So what do you make of that in your reading? Or would, would you say that um, are, are there elements that could be therefore um, authentically Christian if they were sort of re, uh, reappropriated? And what, what maybe would you, would you point to specifically in modern science and not simply um, as a degeneration from, from Aristotelian science. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of which aspect of that question to try and take. Um, I'm sorry, I'm starting to fade a little bit. Um, the, uh, the first part of the question, I mean, as, as you know, having done some work with me, um, the way I trace out this development is to say that um, a, a variation, in fact, on what, what Carlo is saying, namely that um, uh, there is a profound sense in which um, uh, modern science emerges um, out of uh, a theological foundation. Uh, there's also, there, the, and, and that's not accidental, and in fact, in part, some of the deleterious tendencies, um, uh, the reductionist tendencies and whatnot that we've talked about are directly correlative to changes on the theological side, right? Uh, to the advent of voluntarism, which made possible a new conception of law that sounds actually very much like the way you characterize it as a kind of uh, extrinsic formalism um, governing, governing um, things that can be replaced with a variable like X because the actual things that they are have disappeared. Right, I mean, so, so it doesn't matter for a Newtonian and, and, and conception of motion, for instance, um, what the moving bodies actually are. 
um, or for that, or for Darwinian natural selection, which is a, a theory analogous in its structure as theory um, uh, to, to Newtonian motion. It doesn't actually matter um, what the, the entities are. That's part of what I was getting at in talking about uh, uh, the replacement of form with formalism. Uh, and it's a formalism that extrinsically and indifferently governs uh, the, the, the things which have by and large disappeared from view, from, from, from view as quiddities. Um, so I don't think the particular shape uh, that modern science has taken, historically speaking, is um, uh, either A, necessary, because you're right that we're the first, the, it's, it's the Christian West that generated it, um, or so, so necessary in the sense of, uh, of inevitable, uh, but either that the way that the sciences have been constituted are simply driven by the phenomena. They're also driven by the kinds of, of uh, suppositions that lead us to asking sorts of, certain sorts of questions of nature. There are sciences that um, have developed, I mean, in biology, for instance, um, uh, the morphological tradition that uh, retain, you know, that, that stems from Goethe and is having a, something of a renaissance in and through developmental biology also, I think, lacks uh, uh, the metaphysical equipment to do some of what we're saying needs to be done, but which I nevertheless take as a um, salutary response, imperfect, but salutary response to um, what we would say the world is as creation. Um, so it's interesting to trace out um, uh, the developments within those scientific fields. I'm more familiar with those than, um, uh, than with, with, with physics. Um, I'm cognizant of that being a kind of fragmented um, and incomplete answer, but I think it's about all I can do at this hour. You have a quick comment on this, and then further, yeah. he'll, he'll, quick comment. Then yeah, I mean, it is, you know, because the, 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 I mean, one, one key issue that we're dealing with here that's related to the, the question from Michael, it's Michael, right? Yeah, Michael's question is the relation between creation and nature, because uh, there are accounts of creation which basically eliminate the notion of nature, right? Right. Now, I mean, and it seems to me that that would be, that, that's, it, we, we, we would have to bring a reflection on that question back to the thing that Carlo was saying based on, on Simone Weil. In other words, that there probably is something, there probably is something in this, in this me mechanist view of, of nature that does have to do with the doctrine of creation in one respect, insofar as it sees matter as something that uh, whose existence, in a certain sense, uh, is is not self-guaranteed in any way at all. So that uh, it's sort of subject to the, these kind of laws that that are, are given by by divine thought from the outside. But the question is, that's just that's that that alone um, is quickly becomes problematic because it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it seems to, it, it at the very least doesn't uh, give you a connection to and, 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 and could call into question other things that, that are equally important to a full doctrine of creation, like the idea that things have a, a kind of, I mean, it's not an accident that Aquinas retrieved the notion of substance from Aristotle right. in, in the light of the doctrine of creation. Right because it's an intrinsic requirement. I mean, a transformed Aristotelianism is an intrinsic requirement of the kind of doctrine of creation that he has. So it's just, I think that would be one, maybe one way of handling this question is that of course, there's some connection with Christianity, but uh, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be very complicated and complex. Thank you, Father Pietro. I have a question for, um Dr. Lancelotti, actually two different questions. One is on this historical account. Uh, it seems to me very interesting that um, it can be Christian, but it's also Protestantism. In, uh, so the relationship between uh, what you call Christianity and uh, the crisis of Christianity. Uh, it seems to me there is a profound relationship between. So that's the first question. The second question is what you said about abstraction. Because uh, on, uh, you quoted Simone Weil, and uh, if I remember correctly, in the same essay you quoted, she also criticized the brother who was a mathematician um, because precisely 
the, 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 the understanding of abstraction um, was, was, was different, right? So what do you mean by abstraction? Um, that's the question. Okay, thank you. Well, and they are both big questions. Um, okay, to the first question, rather than trying to enter into historical details for which I'm not the most qualified, I would like to stress again the danger of intellectualism. Okay? Meaning that somehow the history of human realities is shaped by the people, the way the intellectuals think about human realities. It's not a univocal phenomenon. I mean, if you look at early modern Europe, there are famous uh, precursors of science for which clearly their interest in science was associated with nominalism, right? With the expansion of nominalism and a certain branch of late scholasticism. On the other hand, you can also find other people for which this was not true. I mean, as I said, I, I mentioned Clavius before. I mean, the early Jesuits, and I, if anything, they were certainly not affected by nominalism, okay, or by the Reformation, for that matter. And still, they were the, one of the major funders and most unrecognized funders of science. So, the relationship between human realities, activities like scientific research and teaching and education, and the cultural constructions that people develop to explain, justify, and describe these developments is complicated, okay? and it should not be reduced to a cartoon. I mean, this is, this is my basic contention here. Uh, because otherwise it's called intellectual. You know, I think that, that, that the world is the sequence of the ideas of uh, Descartes, Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche, and then who is going to set up the next idea. I mean, I, philosophy really usually comes at the end, like Hegel said, the owl of Minerva, or whatever. Now, I mean, I mean, it meant a different thing. But the, the um, what was the other question? Oh, the abstraction. Uh, okay, what I mean by abstraction is when uh, you look at your daughter and you say, oh, if I throw my daughter off a building, she will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. <laughs> this is an abstraction because my daughter is a heavy body. Still, I don't do that, okay? Because my body is not, my, 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 my daughter is not just a heavy body of mass so and so that will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? near the Earth's surface. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is an abstract. The abstraction is when I take an object like my, and, as, and I look at that object as subject to the laws of gravity. And then I, then I am Galileo, I set up an incline in Pisa or wherever I am, and I start rolling balls down the incline because I'm really curious. This is beautiful. There must be some beautiful relationship here. There must be some beautiful mathematical law. And I throw ball after ball, and I figure out, wow. Uh, T, uh, x equal t squared plus, you know, I mean, that kind of thing. That's an abstraction, right? I mean, you, can, you can take the, the ball and, and think that this is a falling object, or you can play soccer with it, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, uh, reality is rich, okay? Reality is rich, but human knowledge is able to capture different aspects of reality without denying the totality of the object, because, I mean, this is, this is missing the point, that you, you, we can look at reality and shed our light on different aspects without losing it. Which is what many disagree. Well, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't think um, what, what, that we can't do that. I, I'm not sure what the sentence is in response to that. No, it's not exactly what I think. But, but the difference is, I mean, let's take a different kind of an example. Um, uh, not throwing your daughter off the cliff at 9.8 meters squared per second close to the earth. Um, <laughs> Did I get that wrong? Meters per second squared. Meters per second squared, isn't that what I said? <laughs> okay, okay, all right, well. Not, not a physicist, I'll, I will concede that point. But, 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 uh, um, but let's take a look at uh, uh, doing instead a complete uh, genetic profile of your daughter. Um, and, um, The difficulty is that what tends to happen is not just to say, oh, if I abstract her, um, uh, if I throw her off the cliff, she'll drop at 9.8, whatever. But rather that these parts, which develop in these ways, are um, uh, how she's put together, right? Um, so that at some point in the putting together of her, she comes to be my daughter, right? Uh, and so this is part of what it means in, in a way to say 
uh, that knowledge is pragmatic. Not that I want to you know, turn your daughter into a superwoman, but rather that my scientific analysis of her basically explains to me how to know her under this aspect is in effect to know how she's constructed. Mm -hmm. What invariably, or invariably, what tends to happen, and what I don't see um, uh, that biological science has the capacity to, and although developmental biology is in a way, in its, in its way, trying to give an account of this, um, is to say how it is that uh, the whole that is your daughter mm -hmm. is ontologically prior to the way all of those genes unfold into the adult that she is. In other words, so that she, in the end, is the end product of that very process of construction which I have now understood through analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the relation of the abstraction back to the original whole from which it's abstracted in a way that's not sentimental. So that, that's why Richard Dawkins or whoever's left basically just the only account he can give of his, doctor's, of his daughter's phenomenality is a sentimental one, not a rational one. And so how do you... How do you there, is, there is something more there than abstraction. There is reductionism. You know? red, red, I think it's one more step. Reductionism is the affirmation that your abstraction coincides with reality. Okay, but then... You owe an account of how it doesn't. Well, okay, and that's what and, and that's what I would argue. That is use the language of form for this. Okay, um, you would be quite unusual, um, well, particularly I in. I got there. <laughs> and, and, unlike Richard and, Dawkins, and, and, I was not born in England, and I got a good education, so I understand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What form tends to mean? Well, yeah, by form, still that that wouldn't solve the problem. Because by okay. form, okay. I mean... I, then I would give you a call and you help you. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. We, we can solve it another day. Yeah, yeah I, well, do, I shouldn't maybe get into this. I would just say, yeah. just this last... Get into it, get into it. No, I, I, I mean, well, there are, but there are two or three things to put together. But uh, just to pick up on this last point, I'd like to, I mean, to say something about Rotzinger. I, I read him differently on this, and I in different ways. I mean, how, the account he gives of the creator, that it's, it's uh, a logos, it's creative, but it's a creative intelligence, so there's an order involved there. But to come back, I mean, so it's a, it's a question of that. Um, love is, is freedom and an order, and what does that imply if all things are created in that? Now, uh, I mean, that's just kind of a vacuous, I mean, very general assertion. The point I'd like to come to I mean, it would take a lot of back and forth, I think, to pose for both of us to sort of get at where the agreements are, where the disagreements are. But, but what does it mean? Is, does it make a difference in doing science if you begin with the thing in its wholeness, the whole? That's the key, the whole. And then, and then, and then does it make a difference if you have a sense of what the whole is? Uh, and and, and what, by what sort of act what is it, by what sort of act do I grasp the thing in its wholeness? And, and that relates back uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Walker's uh, point about creation. I mean, it comes out, science comes out of a, cre um, a context of Christianity, but it seems to me it's not as all, at all clear that it comes out of a, 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 a context of Christianity where there is operative and adequate notion of creation for example, in Benedict's sense, mm -hmm. where there's a real development there. Order, love is an order, that the structure of things is gift. I mean, I, and I'm not, that's not sentiment. I mean, if, if that's a reality, then it's in things. Mm -hmm. And, and but, so to go back to the question of hope, that's, that to me is a very profound question. I'd like to know, if, you know could you identify a science where they, they have a capacity to deal with the whole? And, 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 then, and then the problem is with wholeness, and then we get back to a lot of these other questions, because the, the, the notion of a whole itself, um, that, that you, you can't end uh, with the notion of the whole of this thing without eventually, if you go all the way through in its completeness, it'll lead you to God. And in other words, there's a, there's a community of wholeness, wholeness of the, of the cosmos, which then implies a, a God who is whole, 
I mean, these are the sorts of things, and my question would be, I mean, that may sound like intellectualism, but it goes back to the question of abstraction, and in, in the doing of science, I'd go back to that first question, does it make a difference uh, and, uh, if you start with a recognition of the thing in its wholeness? Mm -hmm. And, and if, if it does, I mean, then you have to have a conception of wholeness and so forth, and I, I would say, ultimately, you, therefore, you've got to, there's going to be some assumption of theology, the nature of love as an order, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if, if, if um, yeah, so, uh, and if, if that's the case, I'd like to have an example of a science that does that. I mean, can you see around us, um, was it uh, uh, what we have, this dominance of, a uh, certain order of reality that we, we call the internet and uh, the computer and so on. Did that come out of a recognition of things in their wholeness? And, and, and I'm not asking just the, the pair accident, so to speak, development of the culture, but the inner logic of science from its, from modern science. I mean, in other words, the shift there, it seems to me a crucial shift, is a shift away from uh, dealing with things in their wholeness to a, a, a way of breaking them up into parts um, and breaking them down and, and, uh, and, and replacing experience with experiment and, and so forth. Anyway, so to co but come back to the question of holes and w would you agree that we have to see, it, I mean, does it make a difference? And A and B, could you give an example of uh, where we have some instances of a, of a rightful uh, unfolding of the inner logic of science as informed by creation. I don't see a whole lot of that. Maybe you do. Well, I'm out of my desk. But I mean, first of all, I, I, would, I would counter ask, is it possible for any human being to become aware of the existence of anything without, in a sense, being presented with a whole. I mean, you know, because in order to abstract, you first have to have a whole from whom to abstract. How can you abstract if you don't have the whole? That's Not, right. That's the first thing. The, 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 the second thing is that, of course, we are somatic, as the Professor Atkinson was talking about. So it could be that the whole was observed by somebody 100 years ago, and then uh, through the curse of Adam or whatever it is, a certain abstraction propagated, and people forgot the whole from whom the abstraction started. But this is a sociological or even, uh, how do you say, theological phenomenon. But it doesn't take away the fact that at some point the whole was apprehended. I mean, at some point somebody saw Lightning, bo lightning bolts and decided to of wonder course. about what the heck is electricity or somebody saw the rainbow and optics started, okay. you know, and that's yeah. unavoidable. I don't see how no, that could it, be the case. No, I agree with that. Now the question is, is that, what was that? Give an example and did that become part, would you consider that part of the inner logic of science? And if so, where is it? I mean, if you look at the early astronomers, Copernicus, Kepler, Clavius, yeah. Galileo. Astronomy is a pretty easy one to do. That's easy. Yeah, I mean, you just you look at the star, you look at the stars. I mean, you, you can't break those up. I mean, you can now when I was young, I remember when I was twelve years old, I saw this uh, this the British documentary on the travel of the Beagle. The Beagle was the ship that Darwin used, and you could see that the young Darwin was fascinated by the variety of natural reality. And then you can to criticize, we make all the criticism of what came out of it, but the beginning was a simple right. wonder. I mean, that's a, quite, a, a simple wonder, but did Darwin er, ever grasp the wholeness of something? Right. Well, that, uh, yeah. no, you have to ask him. No, absolutely not. Because that's the question. That's the question is not, the question is not whether at least the great scientists are, are motivated by wonder at the whole. I mean, I think we could, that's obvious. Mm. The question is whether, I'm just repeating your point, Dave, excuse me, but it's just, it really, I think it's really a crucial point that if, the, the question is whether uh, the science itself includes systematically and thematically recourse, I mean, a recursion from the abstracta from the ansia rationis and all of that to the whole, which is which is which is then which then is apprehended not simply in a kind of enthusiastic schwärmerisch way, but but 
but also in terms of, of rationally articulable principles. And that's why it seems that, to me that however that much you, however much we would want it, we, we would want to sort of deepen, transform, recapitulate, sort of Aristotle, there's something about, for example, the distinction between material and formal causality, which is really crucial here, because it gives you a way of doing that. It gives you a way of, of being able to understand how, for example, a mathematical model um, can, can tell us something about things. It, it, it enables us to understand what it tells us, but precisely as part of that gesture, uh, th there, there's, there's a return of the abstracta to the whole as, as a principle of intelligibility that's, that's able to be rationally articulated. That's, that's why I think that the Simone Weil approach is, is profound and beautiful, but, it, but it's not enough on its own. The, 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 can I just say one quick thing in response to that, Adrian? Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not the moderator. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> I, I'm supposed to be doing yes. this. That, <laughs> yeah, uh, Kate, hey, Nick, can, look, uh, Caitlin had, was there quietly. Well, I mean, first. Can, can we take, um, sure. I just wanna, <laughs> this is going back, but I think it does. Um, it's going back to something earlier, but I think it does bear on the relation of the whole to abstracted parts. Um, it seemed like you, like your respective arguments were in some way inversions one of the other. Um, like for Dr. Hanby, you said that in that science, in its reality and in its actual practice, is more than what its metaphysical assumptions would hold itself to be. Um, whereas, Professor Lanzalotti, it seemed like you said that the science's understanding of itself and recognizing its partial character, like the fact that it is abstracting and seeing only quantitative or mechanical models, um, makes it in some way more than what it actually is. Or maybe it would be more fair to say what it, what it has been interpreted through this myth of its historical development. Um, so for me, that just raises the question of what, what is real um, in terms of the relation between what science is and what science thinks itself to be, you know, which I think is um, the, I guess the, the understanding that science would hold in the background of its own action does bear on this question of holding a sense of the whole in some way behind more particular activities. So what, where does science stand in its, in its reality or actuality, um, taking those into account? Those two perspectives. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll say a couple of very quick things in response to that. Um, first of all, I mean, the, the, the points of disagreement between Carlo and me are actually pretty fine. I mean, there's a great deal in what he said that, I mean, I don't know how much of what I said he agrees with, probably not very much, but the, <laughs> but the reverse isn't true. I mean, there's a great deal in, in, in what he said that I can affirm. Um, uh, and, um, and not to draw out the points of, all the points of, fine points of disagreement, but um, the reason that there is a, uh, th that I suggested that, um, uh, scientific practice um, must be, and the reality of science must be better in a certain sense than it can understand of itself. It's precisely because what Adrian is talking about, this recursion to the whole, has to happen and does happen in a unthematized way because that's what thinking is. The, the, the question is, can you, so, so the, but the question is, is can you give a, a principled account of that and of that being mirrored in things, and not just as a, as, a, as a consequence of the peculiarities of the way I have to think, from within your own principles. Um, and it seems to me that that's what um, uh, every contemporary science that I've run across is at a loss to do. It doesn't mean that you can't say, as Carlos said to me, well, I would just say form. Um, but that doesn't affect the integration. Uh, and it doesn't affect the integration of how you're saying form then um, affects your, what, the, the phenomena under analysis. Um, so I'll leave it at that, because Michaela's been jumping, you know, chomping at the bit okay. there. To okay, 
This will be the last one. So, one question. How much is, is an Aristotelian metaphysic necessary to uphold a metaphysical creation of gift? I mean, how much do, you, do we need? I mean, is that necessary to have a metaphysical creation, to have an Aristotelian metaphysics? Because, you know, science clearly departs from Aristotelian metaphysics of the 17th century. But does this mean that then necessarily departs from a metaphysical creation as gift? I don't think. OK, qua, I would say qua Aristotle, no. No, I would say qua Aristotle, no. I mean, it's not like we have to simply repristinate Aristotle, but Aristotle is, is, is giving account of something that is. Um, the, the, thank you, the dearest, freshest, deep down thing, that without which we cannot and never do live. Um, and the, the tendency of, of modern science, again, speaking generally and abstractly and no doubt illicitly, um, the tendency of modern science because of the, these judgments, these founding judgments and the way they permit, they perm is to deal with that in a different way. It's to deal with it either by A, dismissing it, uh, as, as epiphenomenal, or B, deferring it forever. Uh, a, 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 to, as to such time at, that we can bring it under, this exact, under the same kind of methodological control that um, uh, we exercise on other phenomena. Until uh, this question of reductionism, until in a, in a way, until you can say, it seems to me, um, uh, to give some account of how the intelligibility which, with which you necessarily experience things um, is intrinsic to things. And until you can say how what is last in the order of development is somehow first in the order of being, that is to say, unless, until you can affirm some kind of a distinction um, between uh, an ontological and, and historical order, um, you haven't avoided reductionism. I don't care how many layers, complex layers you add on top of one another and how complex the bridge law is necessary to connect them to each other, you haven't comprehended the whole. That would be my yeah. concluding. This is an abuse of the chair, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but a, a simple thing is the act of creation terminates in holes. Okay, that, 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 that's, that's what reality is, okay? That's a, that's a start, and it seems to me if you start there, substance and form have their place in, in sustaining that. You know, I, 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 on this I agree with Mike. I agree with Michael on many things. I mean, uh, some of the things that you, I think most of them are correct, except the name of the culprit is not science; it's something else. But there is a culprit. I mean, there is there is clearly a criminal here. But except, I think it's, well, it's, except it's the inner criminal. logic. It seems to me we're talking about the inner logic of what has grown up in the modern Absolutely. period. Absolutely, that's not was, just pair accidents. Yeah. It's the de facto, actual, real uh, inner logic. Yeah, I might say it's an inner logic of a philosophical position. But, you know, it, but, it, 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 it seems to me to say that, that you have to take retreat to the idea that science is merely a method and that method as such is neutral. Either that or you have to sort of unpack what the deep ontology of the notion of method is um, it, in, in, order to, in order to say what it is you're trying to say. I uh, trust you on this. So, no, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Can I just say a, 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 a special thanks to Carlo for willingness to come into this environment.